เอทังสันทังเอทังปนิทังยาดีดังสัพบะสังขารสมาโตชาบูพัดฮีปฏินิสสโกทันหักขายโอวิรากุนิโรโดนิบานัง This is peaceful. This is excellent, namely the stilling of all sankara, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, nirvana. Namaste. So I hope you're enjoying the series so far. I played it for one of my friends. And after watching about five minutes of the first video, he turns to me and says, "So, what you're trying to do is convert Hindus to Buddhism, right?" I go, <laughs> "I mean, to be fair, this guy hasn't seen any of my other videos, so he doesn't really know what I'm about, other than I'm an experienced meditator." But It's uh, it's telling that he immediately put it on the dualistic, egoistic, materialistic platform, and infers that my aim, my intention, is to convert people from this ism to that ism, and of course, nothing like that. <laughs> That's the farthest thing from my mind, huh? So, just in case anybody else gets the same idea here, I am not a Buddhist. I am not a Hindu. I am not a Vedantist or a Dwaitan or a Christian or a Muslim or a Democrat or an American or anything you might want to accuse me of being. Why is that? Because I don't identify with any of those abstractions. The Buddha advises us that to be free from suffering, our consciousness has to be unestablished. He says beings are established on the named. Their consciousness. Is based on, and they measure everything in terms of the words, the name and form that they identify with. So, if you go down the street and you ask random people, "Who are you?" They're liable to say, "Oh, I'm a Republican. I'm an American. I'm French. Uh, I'm an Indian. I'm a Hindu." I'm a this. I'm a that. Well, of course, that means they're identified with those words, with that terminology. The Buddha said, "There is only scope for being and becoming within the realm of terminology. That which can be spoken of. That which can be named." Name and form, nama rupa. So, to be free from suffering, to be free from the existence itself, one has to remove this identification. That identification has to cease. We see the mind. If we observe the mind, we see. It grasping objects one after the other in rapid succession, so rapid that even the Buddha could not think of an apt simile to describe it. And of course, he's a master of metaphors. <laughs> so the mind is grasping one image or one object or one name or form, one thought after another. At an extremely rapid pace, like the frames of this video, 30 
times a second give the illusion of a moving picture. But actually, they're not moving, they're still. And similarly, the mind creates the illusion of an I existing by grasping all these things rapidly, so rapidly that we can't even see the, tra the transition from one to another, unless we observe very, very carefully, which is an interesting exercise. <laughs> but the point is, if one wants to be free, if one wants to be happy, free from suffering in our natural state, one should let go of all this grasping, this mental identification with these different names and forms. So one should not consider oneself a male or a female or an American or an Indian or a Buddhist or a Hindu or this or that. Because that's the trap. So to get out of the trap, to be free from the trap, we have to let go. Now, the way I look at the Vedanta and the Buddha's teaching are that these are frameworks. These are ontologies. We talked about this from the very beginning of this channel. I guess a lot of people either didn't watch it or didn't get it. That these are simply models, verbal constructions that allow us to make certain measurements and predictions about consciousness. And of course the purpose being to evolve our consciousness to the highest stage of enlightenment. At which point all verbal models become useless and are given up. The Vedic teaching waits until the very end of the process to give up the verbal models. But the Buddha's teaching gives them up right in the beginning. And that's what makes a difference. That, what, that is what makes it so difficult to attain enlightenment by the Vedic path because one has to go through this really scary experience of dissolution. Whereas the identifications are given up easily, step by step, on the Buddhist path until there's none left at all. So I consider the Buddha's teaching to be a, a superior ontology, framework, huh? for viewing the issues concerned with self-realization. That's all. I'm not a member of any Buddhist group or any group at all. I'm completely independent. Why? It's, that's deliberate. It's not that they won't have me. No, they even, last time I went to a Buddhist monastery, they asked me to stay and become a monk. But I said, no. No. Because to accept that designation would limit my freedom and independence. It would make me an exponent of a particular group. And I don't want to do that. I want to remain free. I want my consciousness to be unestablished. So then the other question that came up was, one fellow wrote, I still don't see how this Nirodo, this cessation, is any different from being in a deep coma. <laughs> I guess a lot of people have this misconception uh, that uh, the cessation of material existence is something like death. No. No, it's not. Death can only exist because of birth. Think about it. Without birth, there would be no death. There could be no death. 
It's not possible. So in the same way, without ignorance, there can't be any diminution of knowledge, of consciousness. Or actually, to use the correct term, awareness, objectless consciousness. Consciousness which is not, so this is the way, the link between these two questions. Consciousness which is not established on or grasping any particular thing. So, to experience this state, one has to experience cessation. Cessation of existence. Uh, the complete stopping and fading away of the process of becoming. And we've been talking about this from the beginning too. I guess either people don't get it or they don't go back and watch those early videos. Whatever. Anyway, so cessation of existence simply means cessation of suffering because existence is suffering. So even after cessation, the body may be there, activities may be there. Uh, look at the Buddha. After he attained enlightenment, he walked all over India, teaching, training disciples, helping people in different ways. And Ramana Maharshi, he managed a big ashram, trained so many disciples, and so on. So it's not like you're, there's no activity. The difference is you're not identified with it. It's not a sankhara because it's not a mentally originated plan. Think about something that you do in a routine way that you're very good at, like, I don't know, blowing your nose or... <laughs> taking a drink of water, huh? something that you do all the time, just a normal activity. Does it require any thought? Does it require any mental effort? Huh? Like riding a bicycle, once you get good at it, does, does that require any mental effort? Maybe physical effort, yeah. But there's no mental effort involved at all. So in the same way, when someone attains enlightenment, their activities are no longer the result of an ontic commitment, sankhara. They don't sit there and say, okay, now I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> and plan, you know, how they're going to grab the glass. See? In the same way, if Ramana Maharshi is instructing his disciples or managing his ashram or whatever he's doing, is he thinking about it? No. There's no mental activity. See? <laughs> this is hard for people to grasp because they're identified with name and form because they're trying to do things by thinking about it. They're making plans. They're making ontic commitments. I'm going to become this. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do that. Right? And sometimes they do it and sometimes they don't. That's because sankhara are abstractions. They're not real. They're only thoughts. So the enlightened person doesn't have these abstract thoughts. He doesn't allow them because this is the source of suffering. This fabrication is how we create all this software of being an individual and being identified with a name and a body and a type of activity and so on and so forth. 
<coughs> See, that didn't take any mental effort at all. Well, why should anything else? <coughs> it's pollen season. So we should let go of substituting mental efforts for action. There's no need for them. Action is action. Thinking is thinking. They're different. Well, action can take place without thinking. Thinking can take place without action, and usually does. <laughs> and most of our thinking is a complete waste of effort and time and attention. Mental objects exist because of our attention. If we didn't pay attention to them, it's like the tree falling in the forest and nobody hears it. It doesn't really exist. It's just an abstraction. Names floating in the, in the brain. <laughs> so try to understand. The state of Turiya, or the state of unestablished consciousness, is like sleep, deep sleep, sushupta, in the sense that no mental activity takes place, no perception, no thoughts, no dreams, no desires especially, no intentions to do anything. Ramana called it waking sleep for good reason. It's completely peaceful. There's no need for mental activity because actually all of our activities are dictated by our karma. So if we just surrender to our karma and allow it to act without any resistance, everything happens all by itself. No need for any plans, desires, and all that. So it's just like our intention here is to document our adventures in self-realization uh, without any aims of converting anybody to this or that or joining any particular group or any of that nonsense. In the same way, when a person becomes self-realized, they're not trying to do anything. Huh? They've done what had to be done. And it's finished. So then there's no more need for planning and scheming and <laughs> desires and figuring stuff out and all that. That all goes away. And it's such a relief. Oh my God. Such a relief. So peaceful. Etam Santam. <laughs> so please continue to engage in the comments. And we're working on the next episode already. We'll have it out in a day or two. And uh, stay in touch. Let me know what your thoughts are. And then we can continue with this series to uh, help you understand a higher view of time. Buddha Sarnai.